This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication. I'm Chris Mack, the professor for this class, and this is Lecture 31, Copper Dual Damascene. Our reading is a short section, 11.2, from our textbook by Campbell. As we saw last time, we have already, not last time, but uh, a few times ago in our discussion of interconnects, our industry has already made the switch to copper. Uh, in the late 90s or so, uh, before then we were using aluminum, but since then we've, m for most of our high-end chips, replaced the interconnects between the transistors with copper. The reason is quite clear, uh, lower resistivity. Copper has about 40 60 percent lower reflectivity, can't remember which, um, compared to uh, resistivity compared to aluminum, and the result is a lower RC time constant and faster propagation of signals across the chip. It also has lower power consumption through those interconnects, but that's a smaller deal compared to uh, the speed. But the switch was not an easy one because there are some difficulties associated with using copper. In the first place, copper is a bad defect. It is called a deep level defect in silicon. That is, it's a defect that lands right in the middle of the band gap and causes uh, serious electrical problems with devices. It's fast diffusing. So once it gets anywhere in the soccer, uh, in, the, in the silicon, it can easily move around and find its way to the critical areas of the device, thus causing um, uh, problems with the electrical properties. It doesn't take a whole lot of copper to kill a transistor. Our solution? We need to put uh, some other material to make contact with the silicon. Consider the source and drain where we have to uh, make a contact. What do we use? We use tungsten. So tungsten becomes our first metal and then we use copper to connect to the tungsten. Uh, not only do we use tungsten as our connection to the silicon, but we also seal the entire wafer with a barrier layer. Tinitride, tantalum, sometimes silicon carbide, other materials can be used uh, that are diffusion barriers so that copper can't diffuse through any of the materials and get its way down to the silicon interface. We do more than that though. Uh, we actually separate our fabs into the portion of the fab that has copper in it and the rest of the fab that copper is not allowed. So as we build up our transistor and before we add this uh, barrier layer, um, we don't allow any copper in that por portion of the fab and the wafers only stay in that portion of the fab. And then only after we've added those barrier layers do we ship the wafers off to the portion of the fab where we use copper and then the wafers are allowed in that region. So the entire structure of the fab is geared towards this issue of, of copper as a deep level impurity for silicon. The other problem with copper is that it's hard to etch. Of course we can etch copper in a wet acid kind of material, but uh, as we'll talk about when we get to our section on etch in a few lectures, copper uh, is not easily etched in a plasma etching system. We use plasma uh, uh, to, to generate ions that are very reactive with the material we're trying to etch. The problem is not the reaction, it's that the reaction products are not volatile and therefore they don't come off and therefore we can't etch. Our solution is to use the dual damascene process which is the subject of our discussion today. So copper is a contaminant. Um, we have to keep copper away from the active region of the transistor and we do that by using tungsten as our first metal. So here's a gate, a source and a drain sitting in a P-well for example here and we have a contact down to the source. Uh, what do we do? Well first we create uh, a salicide, that is uh, we take cobalt and deposit it and react it and create cobalt silicide. Um, then we fill the contact hole with tungsten and uh, uh, that becomes our first metal contact. We seal the entire wafer, in this case I show a silicon carbide seal, and then the copper only makes contact with the tungsten. From then on, we can add layers and layers of copper, copper in a multi-level metallization scheme, uh, but the copper never gets close to the silicon wafer. 
The other problem, our inability to etch copper, leads to the use of the dual damascene process. Since plasma etching doesn't work for copper, we can't use subtractive patterning. Subtractive patterning is the normal way that we form a pattern. I know we haven't gone through patterning yet in detail. That's later. But we've seen enough examples of it. We deposit a uniform layer of a material. We do lithography to pattern uh, photoresist, which then acts as a mask, an etch mask, to transfer the pattern into uh, the layer by subtracting, that is, etching away the regions where we don't want them. So that's called a subtractive patterning. Since we can't etch copper, we have to use an additive patterning step. And the particular additive patterning step we're using is called the damascene process. Now the damascene process is named for um, a very famous decorative inlay metal process uh, that was made famous in Damascus and used in particular on uh, swords, uh, which were very famously made in Damascus as well. Uh, this is where we would etch uh, some pattern in the metal, fill it full of gold, and then polish it off, and you'd have this inlay gold uh, process called the damascene inlay process. And so we named our copper damascene process after this famous uh, ancient sword making uh, decorative metalworking process. It's not quite as pretty when it's on a silicon wafer, but the principle remains the same. So let's look at a single damascene process first. Uh, an example of this is uh, the tungsten plug process, but I'll show it in, as an example in copper. It's a simple three-step process. It's a standard um, additive process. First, we form a hole in the inner layer dielectric um, where we want the copper to be. So it's a negative pattern. So wherever we want the copper to be, that's where we take away from this inner layer dielectric. Then we deposit our metal, filling the hole and covering the whole wafer. And finally, we use CMP to planarize, polish down till we have a smooth surface. We, we stop at the inner layer dielectric uh, and we have a via hole that has now been filled with copper. Of course, the exact same process is how we do it for uh, the tungsten plug. So this is, uh, we've already looked at damascene processes, we just didn't call it that when we looked at the tungsten plug process. That's a single damascene process. Uh, we use something, uh, a slight variation of this called the dual damascene process. Now it looks like it has a lot of steps, but it's really the same thing just done uh, a couple of times. And the reason we're doing this is we're creating an entire layer of copper, an entire layer of metallization. And a layer of metallization has two parts. One is it has a set of wires, but then it also has a set of vias filled with copper connecting one layer of wires to the previous layer of wires. So how does it work? Well first we put down, so I'm up here at step A, we put down two layers of dielectrics. ILD, inner layer dielectric, uh, IMD, inner metal dielectric, and most people just call them both inner layer dielectrics. Um, we don't usually, sometimes people differentiate them by name. But there's two layers of dielectric, say silicon dioxide, with um, uh, an etch stop layer in between, uh, typically silicon nitride. We, we form a pattern with our photoresist here in step B. This is going to be the via. And we etch that via through both of the layers and forming uh, a stop at, at this uh, barrier layer here. We strip the resist off and we've now got our via through this inner layer dielectric. Now, before we fill, we're going to fill everything in one stop, but before we fill, we're also going to build what's called a trench. The trench is where the metal lines of the next layer of copper are going to go. So let's see how that works. We coat the wafer with photoresist and pattern it to create a pattern where our trench is going to be. Then we etch away the trench material. But this time we stop when we hit the silicon nitride barrier between the two inner layer dielectric materials. So I've uh, created an etch 
that has taken away the region of this IMD, inner metal dielectric uh, region, where I want the metal lines to go that make up my next layer of copper interconnect. So I've got two holes. I've got a hole where the via is going to go connecting the previous metal layer to the new metal layer. And then I have a hole where I'm going to fill up the lines that make up my new metal layer. I strip the photoresist away and I etch away uh, this um, barrier layer separating the via from the copper. Now, and I'll talk about this a little more next time, now I put a seed layer. This is The seed layer is required because I'm going to use um, electrochemical deposition to, to deposit the copper out of solution. So I put it in solution, apply the appropriate voltages, uh, anode and cathode, uh, to put uh, copper and have it grow on this seed layer up. So it fills the via, it fills the trench, that will be the copper line, and grows taller. I then do a CMP to uh, etch it down, um, polish it off, and then add a capping layer to seal it off on the top. What do I have? I have a metal line of copper and a via that connects this layer of metal with the previous layer of metal. You see that I've done that by first patterning a via, then patterning the trench, then doing one fill step that fills them both up. That's why we call it a dual damascene process. One fill step fills up both the vias and the trenches, uh, forming both a plugged via and a metal line, interconnect line. This example is the via first process, where I, I etch the vias first, then I etch the trenches second. This is also a trench first process, a variation where I first etch the trenches out, then I etch uh, the vias. Um, the via first is the more popular of the two, but as you can imagine, there are other variations as well. That is the basis of the dual damascene process. Let's look at a little bit more closely at this copper deposition, uh, however. Um, first, copper has to be deposited via electroplating. Um, that's this, the most um, useful way, the preferred way of depositing it. It allows us to fill these trenches and vias. So I've got an interlayer dielectric. I have a via at the bottom and then a trench. Um, as you might imagine, the vias are small holes, and the trenches make, make for the long lines of the copper uh, metal. But I have to fill up this thing, and it's, it's pretty deep, the, these trenches. And so most of the deposition techniques, like sputtering, don't have enough step coverage, don't uh, allow me to fill up these deep trenches. So instead, I'm going to begin by depositing this barrier layer. Remember, the purpose of the barrier layer is to prevent copper from um, etching down, in, uh, diffusing down through the inner layer dielectric and reaching the, um, uh, the, the wafer. Then I will sputter a thin seed layer. The seed layer is copper. It's very thin, less than 8 nanometers. Um, it doesn't have very good step coverage, but it's good enough uh, so that all the sidewalls are covered by a little bit of copper. You need that little bit of copper because that's the seed that will allow the new copper to grow when we put it into the electroplating solution. Um, I won't go into the details of electroplating. It's a, a fairly standard process. Um, of course, we do have to be careful uh, because we want to grow it reasonably fast. Uh, but we want to make sure that we don't leave any voids or defects or any entrapped um, electroplating solution inside the copper when we're done. And when we're done, we've got a layer of copper. We repeat it over and over and over again, and we have multiple layers of copper shown here from the diagram and from an actual uh, cross-section of an SEM, uh, this from IBM showing the, the metal lines. And uh, we see a couple of things. Uh, uh, first, that 
the metal lines are thicker and fatter uh, as they get up towards the top of the wafer. Uh, that's because we need the lower resistivity for lines that go a long distance. And so we, we have the global interconnects that go across the chip at the top. And we have the local interconnects that connect only nearby transistors towards the bottom. So at the bottom we have these smaller, thinner lines uh, that have a higher uh, RC time constant, um, but they don't have to travel as far. And, uh, um, well, uh, they have a higher RC time constant, except for the L squared factor. Um, so because we make L small, they keep the RC time constant small. But <clears throat> if we had really long lines, like it, uh, we would have to use uh, thicker and fatter copper lines. Uh, so if you have a 1x pitch here, um, they might have 1.5x, meaning 50% bigger pitch, uh, a couple of metal layers up, and maybe 2x, uh, a few layers above that, meaning the pitch is twice as big up here. And then finally, uh, towards the top, the last few, you might have 3 or 4x uh, pitch, 3 or 4 times bigger pitch towards the top. Well, that's our discussion of the copper dual damascene process. Let's look at what we've learned. You should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. Why must an additive process be used to pattern copper versus the more common subtractive process? For example, we use a subtractive process for aluminum. What's different? What are the basic steps involved in copper deposition? What method do we normally use for copper deposition? And finally, where does the term damascene come from? It's an interesting history. Well, that's our lecture. Uh, and until uh, next time. Oh, I forgot one. Sorry. <laughs> Why must copper be kept away from the silicon device? Must not forget that. Uh, very important topic. And that is the last of our what we have learned questions. Until next time.